Evening, everyone, and welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton, and this is the home of positive populism. We have a really special show for you tonight. All the big issues, including the economy and the midterms, big tech and China, the deep state plot against the president, and a galaxy of Fox News favorites here to discuss it all. We have Tammy Bruce, Stuart Varney, Brian Kilmeade, Ben Shapiro, Kimberly Strassel, and yes, even Greg Gutfeld. What a lineup. But first, with the traditional kickoff for the campaign season tomorrow on Labor Day, we look ahead to those crucial midterm elections. Here's my take. Republicans are about to make a huge mistake that could lose them the House and the Senate in 65 days' time. So if anyone's watching who has any influence with the GOP, tell them this. Americans' top priority is the economy. But if Republicans think that campaigning on what a good job they've done will win votes, they are dead wrong. People don't vote out of gratitude. They vote for the future. To win in November, stick to one message. Under Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats, you'd pay $2,059 more tax a year. That's the amount Paul Ryan said the average household benefits from the Trump tax cuts. Tax cuts the Democrats pledge to reverse. That should be the message. $2,000 a year more tax under Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. So let's ask some seasoned political and economic experts if they agree with my advice. Fox News contributor and president of Independent Women's Voice, Tammy Bruce. And come in, Stuart Varney, the host of Varney and Company on FBN. So, Stuart, do you see what I did there? I go on Stuart's show all the time. I love it. It's such fun. And he always says, come in, Steve Hilton. So I'm repaying the compliment. I'll take it. Okay. So, Go ahead. What's your question? No, you tell me. Did, did I get it right? Should they focus not just on the economy doing well, but on the simple fact that the Democrats would increase your taxes by well, $2,000? You're onto something there, Steve. And I agree they should go after the Nancy Pelosi's and the Democrats of this world who really will cost America a fortune. But the state of the economy, in my opinion, it is the greatest story rarely told. We do have a booming economy, 4% growth, double what we had in the Obama era, plenty of jobs. We have prosperity. We're back to it. But you don't hear about it. Did you read about this in the New York Times today? Did you hear it on the evening news? No, you did not. So I have no problem with the president and the Republicans getting out there and pounding the table. Look what we've got. Prosperity. It is a feeling of dynamism and vigor. Pound the table. Put out that message. But yes, by all means, say this goes away if you vote that way. Well, I think, Stuart, they should put you out there. You're fired up about it. That was the most passionate articulation of what's gone on that I've seen. And by the way, I think we've got a poll. There's a really interesting uh, poll that shows that people's faith in the economy um, and their belief that it's doing well has, has really, you know, doubled, I think, is, well, the, is the actual data there. You've already got it on screen. So you're right that people are seeing that. It just needs to be emphasized. Tammy, can I get your take on all this? Well, well look, I think that w what's interesting here, especially with that poll, you still see 51 percent saying it's only fair or, or poor. Uh, and it's because you've got a, a media, as Stuart noted, that only focuses on the negative. Uh, and even though they, they've noticed their paychecks, the fact is they're getting hammered every day with a negative message. And that's what, what liberals and Democrats require, is to depress people once again and to make them think that maybe what you think is good is not happening everywhere. Maybe this is an anomaly for you. Mm -hmm. And this is why I do think the president uh, and his team and, and all of us should uh, have a responsibility to remind people about the truth of the matter. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter. And, and look, you've got uh, the, the best uh, economy, uh, like in four years, consumer sentiment, the highest in 18. But the other problem is, and why the president needs to remind people that this is due to policy, Americans can begin to believe that this is the natural state, that this is just who we are, no matter who it is that's governing, that it's, you know, New York's mm -hmm. going to be the same, whether it's Giuliani or, or David Dinkins, right? I mean, that's not true. Policy matters. Decisions yeah. matter. Leadership matters. And this right. is what President Trump represents and what he must remind people of. But on that, on that note, it. I think you could easily attack the far left of the Democrat Party, because it seems to me that the socialists 
have taken over. You can make a very good argument that America does not appreciate uh, socialism, that it's a failure elsewhere in the world, and it would be a failure here. You can frighten voters with that word socialism when you spell out what it means. And I think the Republicans should do it. And we have a real-time example in Venezuela, right? Yep. It's not like this. This is not some kind of seminar at college. It's unfolding in front of us in the 21st century, which is shocking, considering what it did in the, the murder of tens of millions of people in the 20th century. And they want it to return. Yes. This makes no sense. And the Republicans have got to make sure Americans understand the difference. May I just say, Steve, interesting. For, you don't have to go. Yes, I'm go sorry, ahead, Stuart. I, I just want to say this. I'm a refugee from socialism. I'm one of the few people in America <laughs> right. who's actually lived in a socialist society, and it absolutely does not work. I left England in the 1970s when we just about shut down the economy because of socialism. We should stress that. You don't want this. This is America. You don't want that nonsense. <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't it? Because, because the, yeah, I think, again, very, very powerful. You know, you, you missed out on the Thatcher revolution, but you enjoyed the Reagan revolution. So, you know, you probably had it better. But um, it's interesting that that word is just no longer toxic, it seems, within the Democratic Party. They're embracing it. I mean, you don't have to go as far as Venezuela. Just go down to Florida with the, with the, um, the primary victory there last week. It's interesting, but, isn't it? But, um, to, but to some people, Steve... The message that the far left is putting out would be attractive. We'll give you health care. We will give you food. We'll give you a housing subsidy. We will give you everything you need to live, even if you're an illegal immigrant. And that includes that's for California. That to some people, that is an attractive message, especially young folks who've not yet got a big enough paycheck to pay serious taxes. And so, Tammy, do you think all these points that, that, that you and Stuart have been making are going to cut through in the elections, or in the end, the next few weeks going to be all about, um, you know, Mueller and Russia and impeachment and all of that kind of soap opera, rather than these core issues that affect people's lives directly? Well, yes, that's, that's going to be the war of communication. Clearly, uh, uh, mainstream legacy media want uh, the negative to be the conversation. They want to be talking about the Russia hoax and porn stars, right? Uh, and then the American people have got to worry about the future. And they know this. And they've seen the difference. It's been a very rapid change the president's brought on. And they, it's not, you don't have to think back far, and it doesn't have to be a story at the dinner table. You remember what it was like two years ago yourself. And you remember not having a job. And you remember not having any hope. And you remember not having any money. And right. then suddenly, it's changed. And this is something that, that that American people understand. There's, of course, a cadre of young people, as, as has been noted, who've never had a paycheck even, uh, who've been living in the parents' basement uh, and who still who did not get a good education because of the current education system. We're not taught history or, or political science, and they don't know really what socialism is. It sounds good. Uh, and, and this is what still also uh, all of us have to push back on. Uh, the media has to be honest about the truth of the matter about the economy and that it's good. Uh, parents have to make sure everybody in their conversations understand what's really going on, because we had lost the future not so long ago. It's back and it has to be fought for. So that conversation, it's we're going to have mm -hmm. to overcome the negative that the, the legacy media and liberals want to push. Uh, and I think we can do it. And Americans want it. We saw that in 16. We should see it again in the midterms. I predict the Republicans will hold both the House and the Senate. Ooh. Okay. Wow, bold. Very interesting. So I'll give you the last I'll give you the last words, Stuart. What do you make well, of that? I hope and pray that Tammy is right, because I would not wish to see the re the Democrats regain control of the House. That would spell an awfully unpleasant political future. Well, there you go. That's that's <laughs> we can all agree with that. Stuart, it's so fun to have you. I'm really glad you could make it. Thanks. Um good to see you and Tammy, stay with us. Still ahead. Greg Gutfield will join me. But next, big tech under the spotlight this week in a major congressional hearing. I know what I'd do to Google, and I'll tell you after the break when Brian Kilmeade joins me and Tammy to break it all down. Stay right there. Big tech is in the spotlight this week with major hearings in Congress about its role in Russian election meddling. But honestly, that is the least of our worries when it comes to big tech. This week, there were new allegations about the tech giants themselves meddling in our democracy. Are there overwhelmingly liberal workers applying anti-conservative, anti-Trump bias, whether in direct or even unconscious ways? 
It's their dominance that makes them dangerous. No one in our society should be overmighty. Not the government, not the unions, not big business, and certainly not big tech. That's why we need much more competition in the tech sector. Not just one Google and one Facebook, but 10, 20, 100. But it's not just about undermining our democracy from within. The most dangerous thing going on with big tech right now is Google's collusion with our number one enemy, China. China has a clearly stated plan for world domination by 2149, the 100th anniversary of the communist regime. It sees technology as its primary weapon, especially artificial intelligence. Last year, Google set up an artificial intelligence center in Beijing. This year, it's working with China's autocrats to build a censored search engine. At the same time, Google pulled out of artificial intelligence work with our own defense department. So, one of our biggest and most powerful corporations, itself established with the backing of the U.S. taxpayer, won't work with our government to defend democracy, but is falling over itself to work with the world's worst despots to crush democracy. As I've said before, I know the word treason is thrown around too much these days, but that seems like a pretty good definition of it to me. This is what Congress should be asking Google about this week. But wait, they can't. Because Google's CEO, this man, Sundar Pichai, is refusing to appear. Well, he should be forced to appear. Not just to account for his staggering hypocrisy. Remember all that guff from Google protesting President Trump's travel ban? It was estimated this week that China has literally imprisoned a million Muslims in internment camps, brainwashing them to worship dictator Xi Jinping. That's OK, though, because Google just wants to get back into China so it can make more money. But disgusting though that hypocrisy is, Google's threat to our national security is far worse. Remember the Manchurian candidate? It was a fictional story about an American soldier brainwashed into becoming an assassin for a communist regime. Well, Sundar Pichai is the Manchurian CEO, an American business leader who's become a direct threat to this country by acting as the agent of a real communist regime, China, the world's worst authoritarian dictatorship and a mortal threat to America, democracy and freedom. President Trump needs to step in now and stop him. Tell me what you think of that at Steve Hilton X and at Next Rev FNC. Back to discuss is Tammy Bruce and joining her. You see him in the morning, you hear him on the radio. He's the co-host of Fox and Friends and he's here tonight, the author of Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans, which will be out in paperback on October the 23rd. Yes, it's Brian Kilmeade. There Steve, he is. Thanks for having me so, on, Steve. Hey, Tammy. Hey, hey, Brian. Come on. So come on, Brian. What do you think? Google and China, you happy with that situation? Well, I mean, number one, I'll go back to you totally covered it. And what we really want to emphasize is the fact that Google had a contract with the Pentagon if facing what they thought would be an insurrection from their employees. They dumped the contract because some people believe that they'd be working with some uh, some weaponry that would eventually uh, work to kill people. So they didn't want to be part of it. So you say goodbye, red, white and blue. And then you go in the, into China and say, what will it take for us to get this business? So they throw all their values and ethics in the street in order to get a very big check in return. I believe that this is a huge problem. I think the president is onto something when he attacked them straight off. And I think this, I think whether it's a senior vice president or it's a CEO himself, the world's going to be watching. And as Don Jr. said yesterday, He's got three million. His dad's got a lot of people. What if all of a sudden all those people pulled off to another vehicle in a free market system mm -hmm. and they no longer were part of Google, Facebook or anything else out there? Maybe they start their own. So that's a great point, Tammy, isn't it? I mean, I touched on it as well, which is we wouldn't worry so much about all of this if these companies weren't so dominant, if there was more competition. Well, well, yes, exactly. And you've got now Google is so big, it's like the too big to fail, but it's operating like an element of government. And it's operating, as you've noted uh, in, your, in your opening here for this segment, where a person can even just say, never mind, I'm not going to go and I'm not going to testify to Congress because they're beyond that. Google also had a very big role with the Obama administration, actually in government. So I think that there's a sense that they can operate in a certain way uh, w with uh, impunity. Now, at the same time, this is the irony with what, what Brian brought up. The Google employees didn't want Google to work with the Pentagon, but then apparently have no problem with Google then working and assisting this uh, tyranny in China 
uh, that is imprisoning people and also working to create weapons that kill people. Uh, but it's even more than the search engine issue. This first came up when it was announced that Google, because they see Apple is in China, right? So they're seeing Apple mm -hmm. as, as the competitor. And so it's a search engine that they would censor. They would help facilitate uh, the government in its ability to keep uh, the Chinese citizenry uh, ignorant. But it's more than that. They're also talking about using Chinese companies, which are, of course, the government companies, to manage the cloud that would be in China that Google would use, which means right. every, all the documents that would be moved through the, the Google cloud for China would be available to the Chinese government. And, and that is clearly a, a known dynamic. So they're willing to do that as well. And, and it's beyond even just the free market. This is an American company facilitating, uh, as you've noted, and Brian notes, uh, an enemy of this country, mm -hmm. already with, with our uh, 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 copyright dynamics, our intellectual property being stolen. What mm -hmm. do you think is going to happen when, when Google presents and offers and makes available effectively their infrastructure to the Chinese government? Uh, right. I think that, that that changes this game entirely and ramps up a cyber war. Steve, the I, other I thing agree. I like So, to... Brian, go yeah, ahead. Go, go ahead. Well, the one thing, I, I'm looking forward to the hearings next week. I get it. But for the most part, I'm always disappointed because they're not experts. Like, you're an expert in this area. You need experts answering these questions at a high level with these tech companies. Great point. Because they basically laugh at the questions because they're so unsophisticated. But. And I don't necessarily blame the lawmakers. This thing is evolving. The average lawmaker is 50, 60, 70 years old. They're just catching up to this, let alone trying to find out what's next. These companies know what's next. They're not going to tell us unless they're pushed. We need tech experts next to lawmakers to ask the questions to make sure we're on the right track. Excellent point. I, I agree with that. Now, Brian, one other thing I just wanted to uh, get your take on. Um, you touched on it earlier. You mentioned Don Jr.'s um, uh, uh, comments last week about, about this whole issue of big tech and its dominance. Steve Bannon also said something very interesting last week where he was saying this, this whole issue is just going to get bigger and bigger. And he was saying that actually the role of big tech in society could be one of the dominant election issues by 2020. What did you make of that? I think I think he's right. Steve Bannon uh, does things wrong that I, don't, I still can't understand. But other things mm -hmm. he does, he has a lot of foresight in a lot of other areas. But I would say a couple of things are happening. When I brought up that and I presented to you what the Trumps are thinking about and others are thinking about, 67 percent of conservatives believe as though these tech companies are anti-conservative. So if they believe that, they're going to get their own vehicle. Guess what they'll leave? liberals to their own vehicle. Then we'll be on our own lanes. We'll never talk to each other about anything. Social media was once a place where we could collide, maybe too much. But soon we'll say, I have no interest in what you're saying. You're never going to be fair. So right. I'm going to try to be fair. So in a way that would scare me a little. But it, conservatives mm -hmm. feel as though the, 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 Fed, the conventional feeling is that the Trumps utilize social media much better. It's part of the main reasons they won. They're still ahead mm -hmm. when it comes to Facebook and others. So how do you stop it if you can't beat it? What you do is take that vehicle and make it very tough for them to get their message out. And it seems to be happening, but they didn't count on, the tr uh, on, on President Trump speaking up about it like he is, calling them out like he is. See, see that's it. I think well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a behavior of both the system in Washington – uh, being used yeah. to being able to operate in a certain way without being pushed back on. And the, the tech companies, which in fact have had the support of the Democrats and of a certain segment of government. And I think a lot of people think they're just going to wait out the Trump era. Uh, well, this is not going to end. Uh, this is the beginning of a reformation that will be generations long. And this is our chance. What we have to do is decide how it is we're going to make this change, not if we can do it, but decide how. And I agree with, with, with Brian. We don't want to balkanize the way we communicate in this country. And we've got to make sure that we make this dynamic fair as opposed to abandoning it mm. and starting up something separately. Well, it's, a, it's such a, a central conversation. I've got a very simple solution to it, by the way, which, as, 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 as you know, because we've talked about it, I just uh, practice every day, which is I don't have a phone. I don't get involved. I just close down the technology and banish it from my life as much as possible. Anyway, no wonder you never I don't think that's for my everyone. Text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. And don't worry, I'll, I'll be promoting right. the show on Twitter for us, so we're, we're covered. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you both so much. Coming up, mounting evidence of a massive double standard in the Mueller investigation pointing to a deep state plot to undermine President Trump. We'll give you the details next.
Welcome back to the next revolution. The elitist political establishment laughs at President Trump's description of the Mueller investigation as a witch hunt. But it's getting increasingly difficult to ignore the blatant double standards that are being applied. A recent Wall Street Journal article stated, The country has watched the FBI treat one presidential campaign with kid gloves, the other with informants, warrants and eavesdropping. They've seen the Justice Department resist all efforts at accountability, even as it fails to hold its own accountable. And they are now witnessing unequal treatment in special counsel Robert Mueller's probe. Yes, the former FBI director deserves credit for smoking out the Russian trolls who interfered in 2016. And one can argue he's obliged to pursue any evidence of criminal acts, even those unrelated to Russia. But what cannot be justified is the one-sided nature of his probe. In a moment, Tammy Bruce will be back with us, but here now to discuss the author of that piece, Wall Street Journal columnist and author of The Intimidation Game, Kimberly Strassel. Kimberly, thank you so much, uh, not for, just for being with us tonight, but also for that piece which perfectly captured the <laughs> rage that I've been feeling about this for so long. You just put it so well. Could you just take us through, first of all, the specific areas of potential investigation that should be emerging from the Mueller probe directed at the other side but aren't? What are the areas that, that should be being looked at? Well, thanks. And yeah, you can make some direct comparisons. For instance, uh, Mr. Mueller has handed off uh, probe allegations, and then there have been charges that have now been brought against Mr. Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, uh, about campaign finance violations. Well, that's interesting, because if you go and look, remember, it was the Hillary Clinton campaign that paid a law firm that in turn paid Fusion GPS to do that dossier. Now, federal campaign law says that you have to say to whom you are making a payment directly and for what purpose. But this money, again, was funneled through a law firm. Uh, they mm -hmm. falsely claimed that it was for legal services. Um, that seems to be a direct campaign finance violation. Why isn't there some investigation into that? If you're going to do it on both, I mean, if you're going to have one standard for all, then it ought to be applied to both sides. That's one example, just one. Yes. And there's a couple of there's others you mentioned one. in the piece. Um, yeah. the, the, the foreign agents registration, that's a whole area that, that uh, you've got potential guilt on both sides, right? Yes. Well, FARA, again, it's a law that's very rarely ever been held in, into account and used, certainly not for prosecutions. But Mr. Mueller has changed that. He's gone after both Paul Manafort and Rick Gates for failing to file under the Foreign Agent Registration Act and, and explain to and publicly disclose that they are lobbyists for foreign entities. But again, there is very credible evidence, this has been brought to light by Senator Chuck Grassley, the Fusion GPS, that oppo research firm, at the same time it was compiling the dossier, it was also lobbying on behalf of Russians to get rid of some U.S. sanctions and a U.S. sanctions law. Um, now, again, Fusion would say, well, we were working for a U.S. law firm, but it doesn't matter under the law. You still have to register if you are lobbying people on behalf of foreign entities. They never did. Where is that prosecution? Or the prosecution of Tony Podesta, who was also Podesta, lobbying exactly. for foreigners. Yeah, and there's no, this has all just been completely dropped. Now, Podesta, prominent Democrat, and I think that this is the thing that Americans look at really gets to the heart of their frustration of this probe, not that justice is being applied to people who have done wrongdoing, but it's only being applied to one side. Exactly right. You put it so well. And, and there's more, actually, in your piece. Everyone should read your piece. Talking about li lying to the FBI again. There's, there's so much there that's just being ignored. Let's bring in Tammy Bruce now. Um, Tammy, uh, you, you heard all of that. What chances do you think there are for what Kimberly's advocating, that you have equal justice, all these things being looked at, ever happening? How, how's that? What, what kind of pressure can we put on? Is, is, that, is this ever going to happen? Are we going to get well, justice? Well, obviously, the players involved here are a representation of an establishment that has operated like this for quite some time. Uh, we see in the lead up to the election the sloppiness in what we've seen and already investigated, whether it's Peter Strzok and the texts, the behavior of James Comey, certainly, of McCabe, etc. All of these individuals were behaving in a manner that, uh, if you just look at it in a glance, uh, is, is clearly problematic. But for some reason, they felt that it wouldn't be an issue, that they felt that they could behave in this manner, partly because they thought Hillary was going to win. But it tells you that they were comfortable with, with this kind of a framework. Yeah. Uh, and that tells you that it's, it's deep-seated, 
that this has been a long-term uh, way of operating. So uh, in a lot of ways, of course, it confirms the importance of the results of the 2016 election, that the, the nature of, of how the establishment is handled has to change. But in order to do that, we've got to change out the individuals running it, uh, more than just the president. This is a long-term framework. This conversation, though, is important, that Kimberly Strassel can write this article still, have it be read, that we can have this conversation. Of course, this then goes into the social media aspect, which we, of course, will be addressing as, 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 a, as a nation, as a larger problem regarding media, and that people yeah. are silenced. So, so I, I don't think it's going to happen within this context of this investigation, but it is an education for the American people about the value of their uh, involvement and the choices they make in the elections and what they demand of their elected leaders. But this is going to have to require uh, a, an overturning, if you will, not of our, our system. The system works. It's the nature of the people who've been in the system for too long. Mueller is now being seen, certainly, as part of that, the involvement of, of Rod Rosenstein, uh, the choices that Jeff, Session made, uh, Jeff Sessions makes, and I've been a, a big admirer mm -hmm. of his, which has declined a bit, uh, in the midst of the pushback from the swamp. And this is what the president still has to deal with. I completely agree with that. I mean, we've talked about this, this before, and we'll, we'll do again. You know, the, the, the 2016 election and President Trump's victory was the beginning of the populist revolution. We need, not, not the end of it. Um, exactly. So, Kimberly, let me just um, pick up what Tammy was saying there with you. So she was, she was just saying, well, you know, frankly, we can't really be optimistic that, that Mueller will actually do the kind of inve even-handed investigating that you call for. Is that your assessment, too? Can, for example, Rosenstein force uh, Mueller to take a look at these things that you list? Yeah, well, I actually feel a bit naive because when Mueller was first appointed, I looked at the mandate that he was given that said to look into these claims of Trump-Russia collusion, but also anything else that came out of that. Well, if you're going to look into those collusion claims, and, and I think he was right to do so, but you don't find anything, then obviously your next question to be asked is, how did those claims gain purchase at the highest levels of government? And that would require a look at the dossier at Fusion GPS and all the players who were using back channels to feed this information, partisan influences to feed this information to the FBI. I thought that might happen. Um, I now realize there was never any chance that was going to happen. And I think that that's a function of Mr. Mueller and his team. Look at this is a guy you look at his resume. He has spent most of his life at the Department of Justice or the FBI uh, prior to going into private service. He's an institutionalist. He's not going to take those organizations down. Mm -hmm. And I think you can go even a little further. I think it's worrisome. Um, you look at some of the actions that he has taken, in particular his decision to release those Russian indictments on the eve of President Trump's visit to, Russia, to Helsinki. Um, and that does mm. seem to be almost politically motivated well, they can't help and, and biased. Yeah, they, and they I can't. think it's, that's a bit worrisome. Well, it's that. I know. That, well, it, it seems obvious. Sorry, in that Tammy. We're, 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 right. I'm really sorry, Tammy. We're we're out of time on this one. Uh, it, it's going to go on and on. We'll have plenty of time to talk about it. I just wanted to wrap up by saying this is why, as exactly as Kimberly says, people are so frustrated. You know, you, you control the White House, you control the House and the Senate, and still this this stuff goes on. Perhaps a new Attorney General will help. Who knows? Kimberly and Tammy, thank you so much. Coming up, Thanks. why does the establishment only care about what President Trump says and not what he does? How is the president disrupting the bureaucracy's way of doing things? And what do we do about the new generation of robots that feed themselves? There's only one person to turn to for answers to these questions, Greg Gutfeld, and he's next. Welcome back, everyone. All right, so one of the smartest arguments you can hear consistently on this channel is that the political and media establishment that are up in arms about Donald Trump every single day literally do not care about what he does, only what he says. Who is the genius who first made that brilliant observation? It's our next guest who needs no introduction, but he demanded one so we would show his book on screen. Co-host of The Five, host of The Greg Gutfeld Show, and the author of the new bestseller, the Gutfeld Monologues, Greg Gutfeld. There he is. How you doing, buddy? So this, I'm great, and I, I just, every time you make this argument, and as I said, you were the first person to make it, it's so true. They don't care about actual results, they just care about tone and style and what he says. Why is that? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for getting dressed up for this interview. I, I see that's one of your better <laughs> T-shirts. 
Um, here's the deal. He is, he is uh, when he was running for office, all you could go by were his words, right? Because you, you had all these other choices. And so you could get angry with him and you could say, I'm for this person or that person. And he's so rude and crude and he you know, says what's on his mind. But then once he becomes president, you have to decide, OK, enough about his words. Let's focus on his deeds. That's the decision I made because I was critical of him during the, uh, the campaign. And then when he became president, I said, OK, mm -hmm. we already know who he is. We already know what he says. We already know how, knows how he reacts when somebody comes after him. He always hits back, which I think... That is one of the primary uh, problems with the media is they're just not used to it. You know, for decades, our media has been focused on mocking conservatives and Republicans and getting away, getting away with it. For I'd say since the Vietnam War, Republicans have been a punching bag. And this is the first time that the punching bag actually punched back. And I think it's just something right. that they're not used to. And we're, we're like, we've already gotten used to it. It's now two years. We've moved on, right? But they're still kind of triggered by 2016. It is amazing. The other thing I think is that, that you know, the, the, the deeds don't really matter to them because most of the people in this situation, you know, frankly, like us, they have very comfortable lives. Everything's fine in their world. It doesn't matter what actually happens because, yeah, it, you know, it's all going to be fine. It's 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 a, it's kind of the, um, it's the downside of peace and prosperity is that uh, if Donald Trump, for, if, let's take the example of uh uh, terror. So right now we have not been doing much reporting on terror because the Trump administration has been so effective in dealing with terrorist groups. So what happens is we get complacent. And so that allows, let's say the media, it allows people like me more time to focus on words, to focus on uh, squabbles, to focus on, on silly titillating uh, material about, uh, about strippers and crooked lawyers because we're in a time where we've effectively dealt with ISIS. Now, this isn't going to last forever because terror always changes, adapts, and becomes more mm -hmm. effective in, in their own tools. But so the curse of, of an effective administration is that you allow the luxury of right. chasing other shiny balls. Exactly. Now, here in a very, very sophisticated segue, I'm now going to ask you to comment on an example of, of words turning into deeds. Did you get okay. what I did there? So there yes. was something I came across recently, which was it's actually from, from last year, but it was a meeting that the president had with Native American leaders in the Oval Office. And he, it was just this brilliant example of him. They were, there was a conversation about getting energy out and whether they could you know, overcome regulations. And the, the president just says, chief, chief, what are they going to do? Once you get it out of the ground, are they going to make you put it back in there? He just says, get on with it. Just yeah. do it. That's his whole attitude. Once it's out of the ground, it can't go back in there. You've just got to do it. I'm telling you, Chief, you've just got to do it. To me, having worked inside government, that attitude of just do it is such an incredible uh, revolution in how things work. Yeah, well, you know what it is? It's probably the experience of being a real estate uh, developer in Queens, uh, when you go to visit a site and you notice that the, the, the uh, shelves are off in the bathroom or the doorknobs are loose, you don't sit there and micromanage. You, you, you look at somebody, you point at them, you go, just fix that. Just get that done. There's, right. no, there's no ambivalence at all. When you're, when you're at a construction site, there's no ambivalence. You're not micromanaging. You just see the flaws or the problems, and then you say, get it done, and then you expect it to get done. However... He may be too idealistic because, as you know, in government, there's a lot of red tape and a lot of bureaucracy, and people aren't used to that. But so far, because it seems like he's been better than he's been better than batting 500 in effectiveness and in fulfilling certain things, even if it's by executive order and things like that. But he has right. been fulfilling certain promises that he put forth. Now, listen, there's one more thing we need to do. It's a very important public service. We are fact-checking Greg Gottfeld. Yes. I want you to listen to something you said last week. You got Let's it. listen. I don't know why the rest of us sit back passively and allow even the potential for technology to start giving us orders when we're supposed to be in charge of technology. Well, the good news is that we can always unplug them. And they all have a battery. 
<laughs> Did you know, Greg Gutfeld, that that is not true? You can't unplug them anymore because a new generation of robots has been developed that feed on dust and human corpses even. They can <laughs> oh feed God. themselves. We can't unplug them. What about you, that? What are you going to do what? about that? I am very pro-robot. I am the Benedict Arnold of the human race. When our robot overlords take over, they're going to they're gonna appoint me <laughs> to some kind of position. So I've always been very pro-robot. The fact is, Robots are better at being human than human are, being, are better at being robots, which is a confused way of saying robots are great because they don't have any emotion, so they make better decisions. They're not impacted by, like, hunger, or di they're not distracted by texts. They're not angry because they got in a fight right. with a spouse. They are <laughs> so, right. they're, they're like, when you're a, a robot judge, it's exactly the kind of judge you want. You don't want a judge in a bad mood. Right? So there are no moods well, with enough. robots. I agree with that. I just, wanted to, I just want to close with this. I think it's the best comment from a CEO of any company I've heard on anything. The robot company says, we completely understand the public's concern about futuristic robots feeding on the human population. <laughs> but that is not our mission. <laughs> yep. There you go. He's a robot. With that last part, that is not our mission. Remember he said, that is not our mission? He gave it away. He's actually one of them. We need to open him up. Or let you him nailed go. it. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Good sir. Good to see you. See you soon. All right. Coming up, Ben Shapiro has a surprising theory about one of the big differences between conservatives and the left. He joins me next to talk about it. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest's recent article, Conservatives Oust Bigotry and the Left Only Slams Them for It, focuses on the hypocrisy of liberals when it comes to kicking out their own radical members. Joining me now, editor-in-chief of Daily Wire and host of the Ben Shapiro Show, the author of that article, Ben Shapiro. So great to see you, Ben. Thank you so much. I've been dying to get you on our show for ages. I'm, I'm happy that you could join us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I just thought this was such an important point. Um, just tell us, uh, give us some of the details that you, you, you put in that article about you know, what prompted you to make this argument and any wider lessons from it. So in the last couple of weeks, the, the Claremont Institute, which is a West Coast Straussian institute based on the philosophy of Leo Strauss, founded by Harry Jaffa in 1979, uh, they have a listserv. And they have a lot of alumni on this listserv, a lot of people who have been through their Publius mm -hmm. fellowships, their Lincoln fellowships, full disclosure, I'm a former Publius fellow, and I was not on this listserv, but apparently in this listserv, there was a discussion because a former Claremont Institute person had been sort of ousted as a speechwriter for President Trump because he had appeared in an event at which white supremacists had appeared. And he sort of appealed to the listserv mm -hmm. to help him out. And there wasn't a lot of response, but one of the people who responded was Charles Johnson, who's sort of an alt-right trolley figure. And, and Charles wrote something about how the founders were essentially white supremacists and believed in a white majority country. And so Claremont responded by shutting down the listserv. They said, listen, this is not the sort of stuff we want to promulgate, and so we're going to take down the listserv. The left jumped on this to suggest that this just demonstrates the right has a tough time disassociating from white supremacy and racism. Ironically, the, the original article written about this, this story was actually by Eliana Johnson, a friend of mine, and a former Publius fellow over at Claremont. So we're going to slander what? the entire Claremont Institute by pointing at Charles Johnson, but we're going to ignore the fact the person who reported on the study is a former Claremont Institute person as well, who was a Publius Fellow the same year that I was a Publius Fellow, all of which goes to the central contention I make, which is that there are a lot of mainstream conservative institutions who, when they spot ideology that they feel is wrong, they will disassociate from that ideology in a way that the left never will. So National Review has gone through several rounds of this as sort of a mainstream right-wing publication. Yeah. William F. Buckley famously threw the Birchers out in the mid-1990s. Folks like John Derbyshire were thrown out by the, by the folks at National Review. There have been several waves at National Review of people who are seen as, as fringe or quasi-white supremacists who have been thrown out of these institutions. The left focuses on why are these people in the institutions in the first place, ignoring the fact that when they're found in mainstream institutions like this, mm. whether it's Claremont or whether it's National Review, there's an actual effort to oust them. Whereas on the left, I can't name for you a single instance on the left where someone is thrown out of an institution on the basis of a fringe ideology, unless that person happens to be a mainstream conservative, like Kevin Williamson getting thrown out of the Atlantic. But right. if you're Ta-Nehisi Coates, then you are a mainstream respected figure at the Atlantic. If you are Linda Sarsour, you're still seen as a respected figure at the Women's March, despite your anti-Semitism. If you associate with Louis Farrakhan, can you just give us more detail on her? Uh, I think she was a, she's a really good example, Linda Sarsour. Right for ousting its own figures. 
sorry to j jump in, but, but Linda Sasser is a great example. The women's right, you know, lionized by, by people as this sort of great kind of democratic protest. I mean, that, that's a good example, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Linda Sarsour and uh, Tamika Mallory, a uh, bunch of heads of the Women's March who have been deeply associated with, with Louis yeah. Farrakhan, have tweeted out really nasty stuff themselves. And the left has never made a move to oust them. You see this in Britain where Jeremy Corbyn is the head of the, of the Labor Party. Oh, my and gosh. And Jeremy Corbyn yes. is an actual open pro-terrorist anti-Semite who was on the side of the USSR during the oh. Cold War. And there's been not only it's, no effort to get rid of him, there's I been know. an effort to purge people who are anti-Corbyn inside the Labor Party. So while the left complains that the right has been too warm and embracing of you know, David Duke figures, who, by the way, has not been embraced by the right, they okay. are perfectly happy I, I'm to sorry, allow ben, toxic I know. ideas to brew uh, in, in the coffee pot of their own ideology. I'm sorry to, to have to wrap it up there because we're out of time, but it's such an important point you make, and we're going to come back to it because it's, it's a really big deal. Coming up, big news on your favorite segment, Swap Watch. That's next. Don't miss it. Welcome back. We are starting a new series on Swamp Watch next week. How swampy is your candidate? Every week, we'll expose the corruption of two candidates on the ballot this fall. First up next Sunday, Nancy Pelosi. You don't want to miss that. And the big day is almost here. My new book, Positive Populism, hits the shelves on Tuesday. But you can pre-order now at positivepopulism.org. That's all for tonight. My thanks to all of our guests. Mark Levin is up next. I'm Steve Hill.